Lord, with Kathleen, I also want to pray for those not with us. I ask that you be with the Duvalls and Miss Murtis and Father, others that aren't able to be with us uh, today. And just ask that you would encourage them, that you would be with them and strengthen them. Lord, and as Andre prayed, I do ask that you would come soon and that you would uh, bring your kingdom. And uh, Father, that the world, as he prayed, could see your glory, see your majesty, and, and then we could be at peace as a result, Father. Thank you for all these things. We thank you for your promises to do all of what we've asked. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you can hopefully turn back to Colossians 1 if you're not already there from when we read earlier. Uh, Just a quick review. I know, as Andre mentioned, not everybody was here. We had uh, some absences last week, travel, folks traveling and whatnot. Um, But wanted to just quickly review what we covered. We we tied our topic, um, the deity of Christ, to what David and Frank had been teaching previously. And uh, I'll be teaching on the deity of Christ four more weeks, uh, two here in June and then two in July. And we talked about in Jude how Jude had said he changed his topic of writing because while he wanted to write about our common salvation, he had recognized that people were infiltrating the church, that they were teaching, uh, well, they were turning grace into licentiousness. They were behaving in lewd and sensual and illicit ways, but they were also teaching uh, inappropriately as a result to justify, as it were, their licentious, their lewd, their sensual ways. They were teaching in a way that denied our Master and Lord Jesus Christ. And we talked about how that teaching was such that it fought against, it hit against Christ's authority specifically by lowering his status, by making the distinction between themselves as teachers and Christ as the glorious Son of God less, or by taking the amazing and majestic nature of Christ and reducing it um, somewhat. And we talked about how in history we saw this. Some did it a lot. The Marcians came out and just said, hey, we don't actually even believe the Old Testament scriptures or most of the other scriptures that the apostles are writing. You know, Christ is not even affiliated in any way with the the God that had been revealed. God is not a God of judgment. He's a God of only uh, grace and peace. And and so, you know, there's no judgment for the behavior maybe that we were uh, partaking in. Others, the adoptionists, were a little bit better. Uh, They did see Christ as related to the Father, glorious in that sense, chosen through his baptism, if you'll recall. Uh, But before that was just a man like you or I. And again, subtly bringing down the status of Christ, not giving him the full glory of his due as he, you know, says, hey, restore with me, Father, the glory I had with you before the foundation of the world. Well, that is gone with adoptionism. And then the last we looked at were the Arians. And we said it was really the best of the three, but still, in my estimation, dangerously bad. Uh, despite being the best, and certainly the hardest to refute. Uh, They said that Jesus was gloriously pre-existent, that he was born of a virgin, that we share all those things with with Arians. Arius was the presbyter from uh, Alexandria, Egypt, and that's where the the movement gets its name. You guys may have heard more of Jehovah's Witnesses or Unitarians. These are some of the folks that are, you know, descended from that original teaching. They denied eternal pre-existence to Christ, though. They said he wasn't of one substance. He wasn't uniquely equal with the Father in that sense. He was gloriously pre-existent. In fact, the the first creation of God, the first uh, thing that God made, the first person God made, and then as an honor to Christ, Christ turned and created everything else. Again, viewing him as a very glorious being, a very majestic, wonderful, even supreme being, but not like the Father, in a class other than the Father. They would argue uh, that it's wrong for us to view Christ that way. They would say it's like, do you remember the serpent that Moses put on the pole uh, to cause people to be healed when they were bitten by snakes? There's a there's a verse, you can just write it down in 2 Kings 18.4, in the latter years, just before Judah was taken captive, where it turns out that the Israelites were burning incense to that snake. They called it Nehushtim, which is just the, the Hebrew word for snake or serpent. And the Israelites had turned and taken that gift of God and were worshiping it. And, and an Arian might say, that's what y'all are doing. 
You know, you're, you're taking Jesus too far. He, it was amazing salvation for us, an amazing rescue, redemption of our sins, but you shouldn't be worshiping him like that in the way that you do the Father. And there were four verses that Arians then, and groups like Jehovah's Witnesses and Unitarians now, use and point to to defend that idea. One of which is Colossians 1.15. That's the one we just read earlier, and it's the first of the four verses we're going to look at over the four weeks that I'll be teaching. I'd like to start in talking about Colossians 1 with a story. Uh, a story when we moved out to California in August of 2001. Does anybody remember what happened right after that? Yeah, 9-11. 9-11, yeah. We were out there for just a few weeks. First semester classes when 9-11 occurred we went out to california to attend the master seminary maybe two years into being out there we had two jehovah's witnesses come to our door <laughs> hannah our oldest would have been three at the time willem might have been a baby anybody here wasn't around yet of the, of the neils at least um and two jehovah's witnesses visited and i you know shared with them my beliefs about christ deity and his eternal pre-existence his glory his equality with the father and they said hey could we could we send somebody else out to talk to you? I was like, yeah, please, that would be fine. And they sent a gentleman out uh, who was very knowledgeable and honestly basically refuted all the good arguments that I had or thought I had. Uh, I mean, really, a very well-spoken, well-studied, well-learned gentleman who really caused me to question, wait a second, uh, you know, what, what do I believe? And, you know, among many arguments that he shared with me, he, he did share these four verses. Colossians 1, which we read earlier about Christ being the firstborn of all creation. Revelation 3, which speaks of Christ as the beginning of the creation of God. Proverbs 8, which talks about, in some versions, probably not the one you have in your lap, but in some versions, wisdom being created by God as the first of his acts of old. And then we tack onto that Jesus being identified as the wisdom of God. This was, a, this was the preeminent verse that Arius himself back in the 3rd century, 3rd, 4th centuries, used to defend his doctrine. And lastly, Jesus uh, appearing to Mary after his resurrection and saying, I'm, hey, I'm, I'm going back to my God and, and your God. And these were verses that this gentleman shared with me and you know, really shook, I would say, my faith. And as part of trying to sort those things out, I turned to other teachers, as any of us would, you know, trying to understand more. One such teacher among many was a guy named James White. Some of you may have heard of him. He wrote a book called The Forgotten Trinity, a really good book. Uh, he has some debates online with a guy named Greg Stafford that are really interesting to listen to. They were helpful to me. And he had at the time, maybe he still does, I don't listen to him anymore, but he had at the time something called an Alpha and Omega broadcast. And I would listen to some of those. And one of those broadcasts proved to be very impactful to me. A caller called in, he would take calls, he would take live calls, and a caller called in and challenged James on Colossians 1.15. Not just on the surface of it and the way that it reads, but with a specific grammar, I'm sorry, wah, 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 I hate to use the word grammar, but Jen appreciates it, maybe the rest of us don't, with a grammar argument that was, in my estimation, really strong, a really strong argument. And honestly, for all that he had helped me, James White's response, I felt like, was, was severely lacking. It was very you know, impactful to me. We'll talk about that argument in just a second, but that at least sets up for why this is a topic that I've thought about before. It gives you a little bit of the, the backdrop and story form to why uh, this has been something that I have thought about in the past. So this is our plan for today, is to look at Colossians 1. It's to give you the standard Arian explanation of that verse. What does it mean that Christ is the firstborn of all creation? And then to follow that with, what's the standard Christian explanation of that? And then third, we will get into some grammar. I'll share with you that argument and what I think is a very strong argument, very strong Aryan challenge to the Christian understanding of it. And we'll follow that with a separate, a second Christian explanation, which is, I think, where we should all stand. Now, I gave this warning last Sunday, uh, but this is not like our sermon in Proverbs when we talked about sexual immorality, or when we were in Luke and we talked about financial temptations, right? Those were uh, <clears throat> easy to understand, easy to apply, very practical, right in front of us, um, not heady, not uh, difficult to think through. And Jude is saying to his readers, y'all need to beware of both. The very base, 
you know, licentious, uh, you know, purity side of things, as well as this denial in teaching of the authority of Jesus. Jude is saying to his readers, you've got to be able to operate in both of those. And we did already cover again, sort of, and we'll continue because we'll, we'll need to continue reminding ourselves as long as we're uh, in the midst of sin that sexual temptation is always bitter in the end. There's always a, a hook on the end of the lure. There's always a trap around the bait and that we have to just continue to remind ourselves of but when it comes to this teaching remember the the key here was not to dream right it wasn't to speculate remember the teachers from last week how they <coughs> did what they did they couldn't they didn't point to the scriptures they said hey i had a, I, I i perceived this i had a dream i i they make it up out of thin air and it's really hard to fight against right because i don't know I've never seen, like, I, I don't know the eternity past or the ineffable regions of God. Like, that's really hard to debate. But that's why we have to, Jude says, stick to what's written. And that can be easier said than done sometimes. Because, again, while we have, you know, a description of Christ and his relationship with the Father, it's hard. It's hard. It's not like, let me, you know, this is a small book. It's brown. This one's a little bigger. It's blue. Like, those are easy, right? We're talking about what does it mean for God, who every child or adult blows their mind, thinking, well, where did he come from? No, he didn't. He just is. Like, already our mind is blown. And now how does he relate to the Son? Like, these are hard things. And so I give us this warning to just say that it won't be an easy... We'll have to talk about grammar, and we'll have to talk about what may feel like going too deep onto one small little verse. But again, this is really important. A lot is at stake. On the one hand, if the Arians are right, we are ascribing to Jesus what we shouldn't. We shouldn't have sang all those songs about him earlier. We would be like offering incense to the, to the serpent. We'd be worshiping a creature, not the creator. But if we're right, the Arians are denying Jesus. They're teaching about him in a way that lessens his glory. And as we saw last week, that's very serious. It's very serious to deny the Son. 1 John 2.23 says, Whoever just denies the Son doesn't have the Father. Right? 2 Timothy 2 says, If we deny him, he will deny us. In 2 Peter 2 1, we said the one that is the most relevant because of the connections between Jude and 2 Peter said that these false teachers who are denying the authority of Jesus, they bring swift destruction upon themselves. They will false teachers will be among you, they'll secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing <clears throat> swift destruction upon themselves. So, warning aside. I'd like to go ahead and enter into our conversation this morning. And we'll start with the standard Arian explanation of Colossians 1. What does it mean that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation? All right, so I'm going straight to the source, not to Arius himself. Uh, we don't have a lot of uh, Arius's writings remaining. He lost, as it were. He was declared heretical and banished, and all we have are his writings from his enemies, as it were, from Athanasius and the others that we studied. We don't have his own works, or many of his own works. He actually created songs uh, to teach his doctrine, which is really interesting. We do have some fragments of that, as my understanding, are still remaining. But nevertheless, I wasn't able to go back to Arius himself, but Jehovah's Witnesses are uh, in the stream of that teaching and are the most popular, the most well-known group that teaches about in the same way as the Arians, uh, they're, the, they're the group that does that the most today. And here's from their website, jw.org. They say, God created Jesus before creating Adam. In fact, God created Jesus and then used him to make everything else, including the angels. That is why the Bible calls Jesus the firstborn of all creation by God. And then they say, read Colossians 1, 15 and 16. And then this little book, it's from the 80s. It's uh, called Reasoning from the Scriptures. It's from the Watchtower Tract and Bible Society. If y'all have heard, that's the publishing arm of the Jehovah's Witness organization. And in this book, it asks the question, in what sense is Jesus Christ the fourth firstborn of all creation? Well, they say, according to customary meaning of just what firstborn means, it indicates that Jesus is the eldest in Jehovah's family of sons. So Je Jehovah or Yahweh or God has uh, created a number of different people. All the world has uh, been created by him, and he's the eldest of all those that have been created. 
And then in a conversation, every now and then I'll post things that I write on Twitter and every now and then I'll get in conversations, always very kind and gracious conversations. Uh, Twitter's not always a forum for kind and gracious conversations, but I try to keep it above board. Uh, this was a gentleman, uh, Jehovah's Witness, Jehovah's Witness teacher, that was interacting with me on Twitter and just said, "Hey, why should I believe firstborn of creation means something other than firstborn of creation? That's just what it means." And to which I responded, "Yeah, but like we need to use. It's debated what that means. So like we should use grammar and other things to try to get to the point." He said, "Yeah, I recognize that some people." let unscriptural teachings lead them to pervert the plain meaning of words, right? So that's what they would say. They would say, the Jehovah's Witness explanation of this is, hey, it's just what the words mean. I mean, it's what firstborn means. You're, it's right there, as plain as day, right in front of you. And I would say that it's true in one sense. In both the Old Testament, of which there is a Greek translation, so we have the same word, prototokos, it's a Greek word that means firstborn. In both the Old Testament and the New, that is what it means. And I've just put up a bunch up here. I don't even have them in front of me, but the firstborn of, of Abel's flock, right? Abel had a bunch of sheep, and the firstborn is the one that was born first of all the sheep, right? And the sons of Reuben, right? Excuse me. Yeah, the sons of Reuben. Who was Reuben? He was, of all the 12 sons of Israel, he was the firstborn, right? And all of, throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, that's what firstborn means. I thought the one in 1 Kings 16 was very clear, right? Remember when... Israel took over Jericho, and then Joshua issued a curse. Mm -hmm. Cursed be anybody who rebuilds this, right? You'll, I don't remember it. I may have it here. Uh, the foundations, if you build the foundations, you'll lose your firstborn. And if you set up the gates, you'll lose your younger. And here, somebody did that later in the history of Israel. They rebuilt Jericho, and his name was Hiel. And he lost Abiram, his firstborn, and lost his youngest, uh, Segub through the building of that rebuilding of that city. And there you have it, right? I mean, you have the oldest and you have the youngest. I mean, that's what it means. And I think Jehovah's Witnesses are right to say, hey, that's just what it means. It means a bunch of people have been born or created or whatever, and the first one is identified the firstborn. And the one who comes first, according to the Jewish economy of things, has special privileges conferred upon them. And Jesus, as the first creation, has the special privileges. They shouldn't be the same as God, who is unique and uncreated, but, but they're still amazing privileges that have been conferred upon him. So that's the, the standard Jehovah's Witness explanation. It doesn't take a lot of unpacking. It's just right on the surface of all creation. He's the first, based on what the words mean. Now, the standard Christian explanation... Pause that for just a second. Says, okay, I hear you. I hear what you're saying. But that doesn't cohere with everything else I've learned about Jesus. Like, I hear you. I hear you saying that's just what the words mean. It's plain as day. It's right there on Scripture. But, like, I read about Jesus other places, and it just doesn't, they don't fit. So something's off. And so Christians will say, hey, when I read John 1, and it says, in the beginning was the word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things came into being by Him. And listen to this. And apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Like, John, it almost seems circular talk there, but he's saying everything he can to say, look, just take anything that's come into being, whatever, anything that's come into being, it came into being because it came into being through Jesus. Anything that came into being came into being through Jesus. Well, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses will say, well, I mean, other than Jesus, right? But John's trying really hard to say, no, he was with God in the beginning. He was God himself. He created all things. Nothing's come into being that has come into being. And we actually have that in Colossians 1.16 as well. Uh, 1, chapter 1, verse 16, after this phrase, the firstborn of all creation, Paul says, for in him all things were created. And Paul seems to take equal pains to make it clear that nothing is accepted, right? Whether it's in the heavens or on earth, whether it's visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, like everything. Christ created everything. And as you guys, many of you probably know, Jehovah's Witnesses add the word other there, right? And they point to other verses where even we in our English translations will add other to the word all to make it clear. So, you know, in fairness to them, we do that as well. But they'll say, hey, all Paul is saying, all John is saying, is that everything but Jesus that came into existence came in through him. And we're just going, I don't know, though. That's not what it seems like to me. It seems like he was with God. He was God, etc., etc. Or 
when Matthew says at the end of his gospel, hey, I want you to go and make disciples, and I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Like, are you really going to take the uncreated God and a creature and put them together, like side by side? That seems really wrong. That seems odd. So everything in us as Christians say, no, Jesus is equal with the Father, right? He's. I understand that he's submissive. I understand he had a different role, but... It's the same way as husband and wife, right, are equal as humans, right? They're equal as divine beings. So it's got to mean something else, Christians have said. And Christians have learned to point to Psalm 89, which I put up a little early, a second ago. They've learned to point to Psalm 89 as a way to counter this argument. Psalm 89 is a psalm celebrating the Davidic covenant, the fact that God chose David to be king of Israel And now the psalmist is looking at that covenant and singing about it, celebrating it. And there's a section in there, which let me actually turn to, because I don't think I have it in my notes, and I don't want to have to turn and read. So let me just turn to it. Psalm 89, there's a section in there from 20 to 29, which is, again, a greater part of this entire psalm from Ethan the Ezraite, celebrating the Davidic covenant. And it says here, I have found David my servant. With my holy oil I have anointed him, with whom my hand will be established. So who is this about? Who's he? It's about David, right? It's about the Davidic covenant. He's writing about David. With whom my hand will be established, my arm will strengthen him. The enemy will not deceive him, nor the son of unrighteousness afflict him. So again, celebrating what God is doing for David. I shall crush, I'm going to make it clear. I shall crush David's adversaries before David and strike those who hate David. My faithfulness and my loving kindness will be with David. And in my name, David's horn will be exalted. I will set David's hand on the sea and David's right hand on the rivers. David will call to me, you are my father, my God and the rock of my salvation. I shall also make David my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My loving kindness I will keep for David forever and my covenant will be confirmed to David, the Davidic covenant. So I will set up David's seed to endure forever, and his throne is the days of heaven. So really easy to understand what he's celebrating, seeing how God chose David, set him apart, made him a promise for him and his descendants to be the rulers of Israel, and all the promises that God has made to him, Ethan is singing about. And rightly so. Those are amazing things. But what he says in verse 27 is what Christians have learned to point to and say, I will make David my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. And the question being, did kingship start with David? No, No, right? So what does it mean that he's his firstborn? Well, it says it right there. He's going to be the highest of all the kings. He's going to treat him as his firstborn. You say, well, wait a second. No, no, no. The first always gets the best, right? But just think about Israel's history for a second, right? And think about Abraham, right? And he had two sons, right? Did the firstborn get the blessing and the inheritance? No, right? The second did, Isaac. Well, what about Isaac's sons? Right? No, no. It was Esau was the firstborn. He didn't get the blessings. It was passed through Jacob. So, you know, God is in the habit. It goes on. It continues to Joseph's sons. God's in the habit of not always necessarily following that, right? But the general rule is that it's the first. It's the oldest. It's the first to issue from the womb, but not always. And David, in this case, God says, I know you weren't the first. I know Israel wasn't the best nation, the strongest nation, the first nation. I get all that, but you're going to be the highest because I picked you. And you're going to be treated as my firstborn. So, Christians will argue, firstborn means primarily supremacy, right? Or the highest rule or the greatest or fill in the blank. Doesn't always mean first. It it can and usually does. It really does usually. But it doesn't always. And so, when we look at Christ and we say, he's called firstborn, we say, hey, Paul's not talking about order there. He's not saying he was the first made and that's why he's the greatest, right? And so, English translations, again, maybe not the ones you have in your lap, but many English translations, sometimes made for reading ones like the NLT, the New Living Translation or so on, or, or newer ones, Uh, Some good ones, too, like the uh, HCSB, the NET. I like both of those translations. Uh, They render Colossians 1 to indicate that Paul was only speaking about him being supreme, not speaking about order. They'll say things like, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Or let me take one of the sort of contemporary 
made for reading ones. The NLT, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. And Wayne Grudem, as a theologian, he writes and says similarly, Colossians 1.15, which calls Christ the firstborn of all creation, is better understood to mean that Christ has the rights or privileges of the firstborn. That is, according to biblical usage and custom, the right of leadership or authority in the family or for one's generation. So Colossians 1 means that Christ has the privileges of authority and rule, the privileges that would belong to the firstborn, and in respect, or but with respect to all of creation. The NIV, Grudem says, translates it helpfully, the firstborn over all creation. And with that, we now have the standard Arian explanation of firstborn of all creation, and now the standard Christian explanation. But here's where the argument that the man made on the phone call to James White, and is in this book as well, Reasoning from the Scriptures, I think it changes the game. In my estimation, it's a very strong, I'll use the word scientific, <laughs> I just mean it's based on grammar. People like scientific arguments these days based on data. It's based on grammar. And to explain it, I'm going to have to use some grammar. So forgive me. Um, I want to start with English grammar first. I'm going to show you four sentences. Okay, And in each of these four sentences, there is a word in green followed by a word in orange connected by the word of. All right? So they're all the same in that sense. There's a word in green, followed by a word in orange, connected with the word of. Now I want to ask you, my grammar students, how is the green word related to the orange word using the word of? How are they connected? Let's look at the first sentence. Hear the word of the Lord. What is the relationship between word and Lord? Well, if you think about it, does somebody have an answer? It's a prepositional phrase of the Lord. The word is the pre predominant word in that in that sentence, and it's of the Lord. So the word is preeminent, and it's the word of the Lord. Okay. So Andre is saying these are you know like prepositional phrases, right? Um, but what what's being said? And I'll, I'll answer. I mean, please feel free to answer. I, well, Isaiah is going to take a shot. Okay. Is the Lord owns the word. Hey, the Lord owns the word. Well, well done. That's right. It's possessive, right? It's possessive. Sometimes, any I know Jen is. Any other Spanish speakers here? Like you know, that's how they do possession. They do de la whatever or, or del. It means of the whatever, right? And we shorten that sometimes when we smooth out our translations. We'd say it's the Lord's word, and we use our apostrophe s, right? But in this first case, this is possessive, right? Whose word is it? It's the Lord's, okay? So sometimes in English grammar, we might use the word of to indicate possession. It's the word of the Lord. It's the Lord's word, especially if we're translating from Spanish. But in general, we might use the word of, and we would call that usage of the, that usage of the word of possessive. So far, so good. I hated grammar when I was in middle school. I hated it. I love it later. I hated it. All right, second sentence, okay? Henry is just one of the boys. One of the boys. What's the relationship between one and boys there? It's not possessive, right? The boys don't own the one. It's partitive, a special word called partitive. It's one of them, right? You've got, a, you've got this group of boys, and we're singling out one part of the group, right? So that's totally different usage, all by the word of, right? We're pretty amazing as... Uh, readers and speakers that we can just sort of figure that out on the fly, right? We're using that same word in two different ways. In fact, there's a lot more than two different ways. So we'll get to Kathleen. Did you have something? Yeah. So that's the first time I've heard part of. Can I say part of? Yeah, part of. Yep. Yeah, it's a part. It's part of it, right? It's a. Uh, uh, the the runt of the of the litter would be another example, maybe, right? I'm, I'm not. I'm, dangerously trying to make things up on the fly here. <laughs> One out of a group. Though. One out of a group. That's exactly what it means. Okay, let's go to the third one. They retreated for fear of the enemies. The enemies don't own the fear. The fear is not one part of the enemies. So we're dealing with another use case here, right? 
This one we would call an objective use, objective, okay? And these aren't that important. We'll get to the gist of it here in a second. My goal is not for us all to be great English people. Like we can survive without that, but it matters here. Okay, so fear is kind of like, a, it's a noun there, right? It's a thing, but it's kind of like a verbal now, right? I mean, we use the word fear itself as a verb. I fear, you know, the test that's coming, right? And so what is the object of that fear in this case? It's the enemies, and we connect it with of to show what the object of the fear is. The object of the fear is the enemies. And the last one will be the exact opposite. It's called the subjective use. We're going to connect the two nouns, and the subject will be the thing that follows the of. They awaited the arrival of David. Who's doing the arriving? David. David. He's the subject of that. Okay, so again, amazing that we can do all that. We just sort of figure that out. We hear, we understand. We don't have to know grammar to be able to survive in the world. Uh, it's good, uh, but we, we, we get by without it. And, and just as an example, um, well, let me figure out where in my notes I wanted to do that. No, it's later. So the point of this is Greek grammar has the same concept of this of. Of is used four different ways. Greek has of in grammar as well. It's called the genitive case. Who cares? It doesn't matter. But that's what it's called, the genitive case. And it's basically of. It's like of. And in the same way that our of can be used in a number of different ways, their genitive case can be used in a number of different ways as well. And again, how do Greek speakers know how it's being used? The same way we do. We just read it, hear it, and make sense of it. Do you remember when we were talking about kings back in April of last year and I put this slide up? Do you guys remember this slide? Yeah, some people remember that even. Can you read it? Yeah, right? So we talked about in those days that the Hebrew uh, writings didn't have any vowels. And we said, well, how did, how did that work? And we said, well, you'd be surprised. You can make it work without vowels, right? And similarly, we don't have to know grammar necessarily to be able to, to speak and communicate with each other. However, it's important when we get into a debate that's now lasted a couple of thousands of years to get into the grammar. Colossians 1.15 has that of, that genitive case, right? The firstborn of all creation. And I put it in green and orange so that we can, you know, remember back to our English grammar lesson just a moment ago. Colossians 1 has a genitive case in it. So we've got to ask ourselves, how is it being used? Is it being used objectively, subjectively, partitively, possessively, something else? Well, here's where the argument gets interesting. If you do a search of firstborn with the genitive case, firstborn of, all through the scriptures to see where it's paired, you have just under 100 instances, 80 some odd instances of that. And there are two ways only that it's used consistently throughout all those instances. I'm going to put them up on the screen. Some examples of each of the two ways, and I'm going to ask you, can you see, Is it are they being used subjectively, objectively, partitively, possessively, or none of the above? <coughs> Way one is not partitive. Which one? Way one. Way one is not partitive, so think about that. It's subjective, isn't it? It's not subjective either. It's, 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 it's not objective. Possessive. So let me explain real quick. It's not partitive because the firstborn in this case um, is not, it's, Jacob isn't a group per se that it's a part of, right? It's Jacob's firstborn. He owns the firstborn as it were. It's his. Sometimes own sounds weird, but it's his, his firstborn, right? It's not objective because firstborn is not really verbal. It's not, you know, what's the object of firstborn? It's kind of hard to say that, or subjective similarly. But all of way number one are possessive, right? So the firstborn of Pharaoh. Who's firstborn? Pharaoh. Pharaohs, right? The firstborn of the slave. Who's firstborn? The slaves, right? The firstborn of Egypt. Egypt had a firstborn, right? Okay, so that's the first use. What about the second? Part of the Partitive, that's right, it's partitive, right? So, of all your sons in Exodus, I'm talking about the first one. Or of all your herd, I'm talking about the one that was born first. Right? So, if you look at firstborn with of, or firstborn with the genitive case, it's always either possessive or partitive. 
This is the argument. It's hard to get to, but it's the argument that that gentleman made uh, on the phone call to James White. And it's uh, the argument as well that this little book makes. I'll read it to you. It's, in my opinion, a very strong argument for uh, the Arians because it leads to their understanding, right? I mean, Jesus, they're saying, is a part of creation. Yes, the highest, most supreme part, but yes, he's a part of creation. Oh, and I actually skipped a logical step there, which was to say, remember, our firstborn of creation is clearly not possessive, right? I mean, it's not like creation, it's not, Christ is not creation's. It's not creation's Christ, right? If anything, it's the other way around. Christ owns creation, not the other way around. So it's not being used possessively here. So if you strike that one off, we're left with partitive, unfortunately, right? Which is the Jehovah's Witness argument. Let me read to you what they say here. Before Colossians 1.15, the expression, the firstborn of, occurs upwards of 30 times in the Bible. So we're already a little hesitant because they only said there's 30 there's like 80 some odd so they're already making a mistake here yeah they're neat tools now that didn't exist in the 80s so i guess i got to give them cut them some slack Um, and in each instance that it is applied to living creatures the same meaning applies again not true there's two and in fact the first example will be wrong the firstborn is part of the group the firstborn of israel is one of the sons of Israel. Again, that's a possessive use. But their point is still valid, even though they're really bungling it. Right? <laughs> the point is still valid. The firstborn of beasts are themselves animals. That's right. What then causes some to ascribe a different meaning to it at Colossians 1.15? What causes Christians to say, that's not the case here. Jesus isn't a part of creation. Is it Bible usage? Or is it a belief to which they already hold and for which they seek proof? That's a really good question. Well, I so the, their argument is that it's not Bible usage, right? Because you look at every usage of the Bible, and it's either possessive or partitive. And we say, this was not possessive, but it is not partitive. And so we, and they say, well, why do you say that? Because Bible usage shows it's always that. And we say, well, because Jesus is not created. <laughs> I've seen all these other verses. And so their point is, yeah, you've got a theology that you're bringing to the Bible. And, and generally speaking, that's not a good thing, right? Generally speaking, you want your theology to be driven from the Bible out, not your theology into the Bible, right? And so, hey, it's a really good argument. It's a, It was an impactful argument to me. It's, to me, a probing and fair question. Now, this other really big book, is a Greek grammar, right? A well-known Greek grammar by a guy named Dan Wallace. Uh, I was in Israel on a trip and got to play basketball with him. And I have the distinction, Brandon, of blocking his shot. So he may know more Greek grammar than me, but he, I blocked his shot on the court. (laughs) But he speaks about this and he says Colossians 1 is a genitive, and that's just the fancy word for of, a genitive of subordination. In other words, the thing after of tells what the thing before is over. Or said differently, the thing after the of is under the thing before. But if that's the case, it's the only example of this in the entire Bible, right? It's not found elsewhere with firstborn in the genitive. And Dan's arguments are, in my opinion, no stronger than James White's, despite what a great, you know, student of the Bible he is. Again, everybody makes mistakes, you know, and I think he has made a mistake here. You know, he gives the argument, again, that, hey, Jesus is presented as non-created and divine in the Scripture, so it can't be saying that here. But that's exactly the point of this little book, right? Is, hey, you're you're bringing a previously held belief into it and not letting the science, the grammar of it, drive your belief. So what do we do here? It feels like we're backed into a bit of a corner, right? Do we hold our doctrine of Christ being fully divine uncreated, co-equal, and co-eternal with the Father and call this a genitive of subordination like all those other English translations? Or does this text drive us to seeing Jesus as the first created being, extremely glorious and worthy of honor, but not equal to the Father? An idea that does very much seem to smack against many other scriptures. Well, as I've done before, as we've studied difficult passages, before answering, 
I'd like to remind us of what, to me, is helpful when I get into a situation like this, which is what Peter said in John 6. Remember John 6? Peter was backed into a corner, right? Jesus was saying some really weird things. He was, at least seemingly, right? He was saying, hey, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood if you want to follow me. And this huge crowd that's following Jesus is dispersing. They're like, this guy is wacky. He's saying some wacky things. So I understand he just did some amazing things, but I'm gone. And he turns to Peter. Remember what he says? He says, hey, do you want to leave too? And Peter says, in words I think we should all take to heart, to whom shall I go? You have words of eternal life. And I think there are going to be unanswered Bible questions. There's no question. I think there are things that we're going to not be able to explain very well. And I think if there's too many of those, we should rightly probably be called out on it. But there are going to be some really hard ones that we can't understand. And at some point, we don't come to God because we fact-checked everything in the Bible with a, a pen and carefully and checked everything and said, I have come to the conclusion in my wisdom that everything is completely perfect here and I'm now coming to the Lord. No, we come to the Lord because of His glory and we're drawn and it's amazing how He's majestic and forgiving and loving and yet so, and and we're drawn, right? And, and we believe because something in us tells us that's right, you know? And we understand most of it too. Again, faith comes from understanding, but there are things we don't understand. I mean, the Bible itself says the secret things belong to God, but those revealed to us and to our children something. I don't remember exactly how it goes. I think it's Deuteronomy 29, 29. So I think that I have to just say with Dan Wallace, like back me into a corner. Like, I don't understand it, but I'm going with the generative subordination. That's what I would say, except I'm gonna give you another explanation in a second. But I think I'd go there before I would become a Jehovah's Witness, right? Because of everything else that is, in my opinion, clear. I've just got to let them poke at me and, and, and say, you win, you're right. I can't explain it. I am taking my understanding of Jesus to this passage, and I'm saying it's got to mean something else. And before I give my explanation that helps us to get out of the corner, in this one instance, at least, I want to tell the other story that I always tell here, because I think it's always worth repeating and helpful to us, and will be encouraging when we get into the next situation, whatever it is. And that is King Belshazzar and Daniel. I know a lot of you have heard me tell this story. But King Belshazzar was the, the king who saw the handwriting on the wall, right? And was the king who was drunk the day the Medes and Persians destroyed Babylon and took over the kingdom, right? Now, Babylonian history is like American history in the sense that it's well-known, or Roman history, or English history. Like, there's tons written about it. We have lots of records of it. Tons. And there is no Belshazzar. He was not the last king of Babylon. It was Nabonidus. And for years, for decades, for centuries, people said... Daniel, the book of Daniel, is worthless because it can't even get the names of the kings right. right? And so I'm sure a lot of people were swayed by that. right? But then in 1854, an archaeological find demonstrated that Nabonidus did have a firstborn son named Belshazzar. Never knew of it before. Not in any other records. And in 1882, a text, a translation of a text was published that showed that Nabonidus was a bit of a world traveler. He didn't like palace life. He would leave and go on archaeological hunts or whatever. I don't know what you did in, in those days when you would go for pleasure, but he would go off, and who would he leave in charge? Belshazzar. He even dubbed him co-regent for that purpose. And so when you read in Daniel, when he brings Daniel in, I think it was his mom that brought him in, I don't remember, and said... Hey, you read this handwriting, what will I give you? Do you remember what he said? Third, third place in the kingdom. What's he offering third for? Because he's, he's second, right? So then all of a sudden it's like, hey, I'm not in a corner anymore, right? This all makes sense. But for years before that, we had no good answer, okay? I just say all that to say that there's going to come a time, I don't think it's on Colossians 1, I'm going to give you an answer I think explains it, but there's going to come a time when you're going to get back to the corner and you're not going to be able to explain it. And my encouragement there is not to make something up. I think I used this talk when we talked about Isaiah 7, right, and the difficulty there. It's not to make something up, but to say, I believe Christ. I don't understand it. I'm limited, but I believe Christ, and I'm sticking with him. He has the words of eternal life. Mock me, if you will, whatever, but that's where I'm staying. So... I mentioned ultimately, even if I can't make sense of this, I'm going to stick with Dan Wallace. I'm going to call it a genitive subordination, and I'm going to continue to see Christ as fully divine 
and uncreated based on the rest of scriptures. As I mentioned, the scriptures we have in front of us are harder than this one. And I think my arguments are less compelling than this one. So it's going to get harder. But I do think in this case, we do have an answer to give. And it's what I would like to give in this last part, which I'll call another Christian explanation, which again, I think is where we should stand. Now, catching up. Okay. Now this explanation is also going to require some grammar. Namely, a new term to, to offer to you. Jen, I'm sure, has heard of it. Maybe others. But it's called apposition. Right? Apposition. Now, I've got apposition d- demonstrated in these two sentences here. In the first sentence, I say, my friend, Frank, is taking me to the airport. That what I said took me to the airport. In the second sentence, I say, my friend and Frank took me to the airport. Right? The first is apposition. Apposition just means putting two things right next to each other. Right? With nothing in between. All right? You see that my friend and Frank are right next to each other with nothing in between. And when you do that in grammar, apposition means you're saying those are the same person, right? And you guys, again, you don't, you might not could have explained that position before, but you knew that, right? You knew when I say, hey, my friend Frank took me to the airport, you knew that I was saying my friend and Frank are the same person. But if I instead put something in between them, namely a conjunction and, if I say my friend and Frank took me to the airport, what happened there? <laughs> Two people took me. Is my friend Frank what well, he is? But in that sentence, my friend in that sentence is not Frank. I'm talking about somebody other than Frank. So far, so good? That's apposition in a nutshell. The positioning of things or the condition of being side by side or close together. Now, look back at Colossians 1. Notice that there are two phrases in Colossians 1. Who is, we're talking about Christ, right? If you go far enough back, the antecedent, the person, the who, that's Christ. Christ is the image of of the invisible God, there's phrase one, Christ is the image of the invisible God, comma, the firstborn of all creation. Now, how are those two phrases connected? Image of invisible God, firstborn of all creation. Is the second explaining the first? No, right? Because there's no for or because. You know how we've talked about the word for or because? It's not, he's the image of the invisible God because he's the first, that would be explaining it which is what's happening in verse 16, right? If you look at verse 16, he's explaining what came before because he uses the word for. So, But that's not how the two phrases in 115 are connected. Are they in contrast with each other? No, because what are we missing? The word? And. Well, or. no, contrast. Like but it would be, he's the image of the visible God, but the first one. So they're not contrast. Are there two separate things? Is the word and there in between them? No. no. no so you're not talking about, so he's using apposition, right? They're connected using apposition. They're set right next to each other with nothing in between, which means grammatically that they're saying the same thing. Now that's a helpful hint because the second one's really hard and puts us in a corner, but the first one's not hard and we don't even disagree with the Arians on it, right? What does it mean that Christ is the image of the invisible God? Well, can God be seen? No, he's invisible. Listen to these verses. John 4, the woman at the well that David mentioned earlier. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. That means he's not corporal. He doesn't have a body. 1 Timothy 1.17, now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory. You can't see God. He's not another thing that causes us to be mocked by unbelievers, right? You can't see him. Show me him and I'll believe. Well, he's invisible. Well, that's convenient. Well, no, he really is. <laughs> that's what he said, right? But anyways, the mocking will have to come. I can't fix that. But Christ makes the invisible God visible, right? John 1, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him or exegeted him is the word. It's the same word that you hear preachers talk about. You know, you exegete the scriptures, you explain them. That's what Jesus did for the invisible God. Or John 14, you guys all know, right? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How did Christ do this? How did Christ make the invisible God visible? Because Christ, was Christ visible previously? No, like, I mean, there were what we call Christophanies where you would, you know, see manifestations. Like even Isaiah, when he looks in chapter 6 and sees holy, holy, holy on the throne, John says that was Christ on the throne. 
right? So there were times that there were, but in general, Christ was not in the flesh, as we would call it, right? But the New Testament makes a very clear point, even anathema, is it anathematizing? Whatever, cursing the people who won't refuse to say that Christ came in the flesh. They make a big point that Christ came in the flesh. So how did Christ make the invisible God visible? What did he do? He took on human flesh. How did he do that? Incarnation. Incarnation. He was born of a virgin. He came and was born. Now that's what happened. That's how Christ, Arians would say that. That's how we would say it. How did Christ, John, that's how John says it, right? John says the word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? That's how everybody in the world would say that Christ images the invisible God. No debate. That's how the first half of the verse, the first phrase in Colossians 1, that's what it means. Now, if apposition is being used there, then what does that mean about the second part? It means he's saying something similar there as well. Right? So if the first half, because that's what apposition does. My friend, Frank, took me to the airport. He's the invisible, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, squeezing those two things together. Well, if the first is saying that he became flesh and made visible God, the second is saying something like that too, because they're placed together. So what does it mean that he's the firstborn of all creation? Is Christ a part of creation? Yes. 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 It's a partitive genitive. I'm sorry. The science says he's a part of creation. Is he a part of creation because God made him first and then made everybody? No. How did Christ become a part of creation? He was born. Now, does that make him first? It makes him preeminent. Well, wait a second. I thought firstborn was first. That's when we turn to Psalm 89 and say, yeah, generally speaking, you're right. But every now and then, there is someone special who gets the rights of the firstborn, or a special case, you could even say, who gets the rights of the firstborn, even though they're not first. And he's saying Christ is that person. Why? Why does Christ get that? Well, he answers it in verse 16. Now he uses the word for. Why does Christ get to be special even though he wasn't first? Because he actually made everything. So in view of that, even though he was a lowly baby born in the middle of history, perhaps, he's going to get to be the preeminent because he actually, this being that we see and touch and feel, he actually made everything. I know that's hard to believe, and that's what Paul is writing to his writing, but he made everything. And so he is the preeminent. Now, that's a good segue, I think, Actually, I need to say one thing before I say my line about a segue. Um, that's the answer, I think, to Jehovah's Witnesses in Colossians 1, or Arians, or Unitarians, or whomever. That's the answer to how we explain Colossians 1 without denying the grammar, which I'm willing to do if I have to, uh, because I believe Christ is uncreated. But I don't want to do that because it puts me in a bad position. That's the answer. And it isn't right for an Aryan, even to use the word born, I mean, that's interesting. There is a word for created, right? And he calls Christ the firstborn, which is interesting. But so they are wrong to take that phrase and put it back to some supposed early first act of God. It's talking about Christ's birth, not about some supposed, non-existent in my view, first act of God in creating Christ in time. But that's a good segue to next week because Revelation... 314 sounds like there was a supposed first act of God. So let's just say that in this pretend debate between us and Arians or Athanasius and Arius or us and Jehovah's Witnesses that they say, all right, I yield on Colossians 1. Maybe Christ is firstborn in that sense through his birth and because he created all things. But there was a creation at one point, and Christ was the beginning of it. And that is harder to explain, but we'll do that next week. So, we're going to pray, uh, we're going to sing about um, our glorious Christ, and then we will come back next week to try to make a convincing argument about Revelation 3, which is harder than Colossians 1, in my opinion. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for your scriptures and we thank you, Father, for the warnings that were given uh, early on 
it's hard for us to see ahead. It's hard for me to see ahead, to know the future, to know not even the future, but just to, to think about what do I need to be thinking about? What, what do I need to be caring about and, and preparing and uh, protecting and being careful of? Because it's so hard to know. And yet through your spirit, you, through the apostles, warned your church early on that there would be heresies that would be in service of licentious behavior that would lower your son, that would deny his authority by trying to make him less than he than he is. And Father, these are not easy to understand. You are, uh, to use the analogy, as far from us in one sense as we are from chickens. And yet you are gracious to condescend, to become even a man, to give us your spirit, to glorify us in that sense, and to one day ultimately glorify us. And so we thank you for all that, God. We thank you for the warnings. We thank you for uh, the fact that we can, because of your warnings, be on the guard. Be on guard for traps, for bait, for lures that would tempt us to be sexually immoral. uh, And and then feel the bitterness when it's too late to maybe not be able to get out of that trap. And you've given us warnings, God, to not uh, allow us, to not have us reduce your glory, to think lesser of you than we ought. But that's hard. It's it's hard, and we've, we're thankful, God, for your warnings. We're thankful for the people that have gone before us uh, to fight, to, to contend, to use the word that you use and that David has been teaching us so faithfully for weeks about. Uh, Father, thank you for what they've done to make it more easy for us to be able to look and see and say, ah, I see the wiles, I see the, the wrongness of those that we're trying to demean you. I understand why they're doing it and to help us to be on our guard. Help us, Lord, to to humbly love and serve you and love each other and to uh, be faithful until the day that you do return that Andre prayed about this morning and, and ask that you do that, Father, and that you bring peace and your kingdom to this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's stand and sing together.